Today we're going to be looking into Rust, a language I'm mm-hmm. not familiar with, except for some articles I've read about it. So we're better off um, starting from the very beginning, which is what is Rust? Let's look into that together. So Rust is a systems programming language that runs blazing fast. We'll see about that. Prevents seg folds and guarantees thread safety. Okay, all amazing things. It aims to bring modern language design and an advanced type system to systems programming. That's definitely welcome. I don't have any experience with systems programming, but I guess these are very important things in that uh, area. Rust does not use a garbage collector using advanced static analysis to provide deterministic drops instead, meaning your application won't have to um, stop here and there to um, garbage collect or clear up memory for um, areas of memory that are not needed anymore. Um, But thanks to this deterministic uh, static analysis, uh, things will only be cleared when when needed and in a concurrent way uh, with respect to the rest of the um, program execution, which sounds great. It accomplishes this via the concept of ownership, which hopefully we'll look into today. Rust core and the standard library are intentionally minimal. Batteries are not included. Rustations, okay, that's the name, we'll have to get used to that, are instead encouraged to add libraries called crates to the language by sharing them on crates.io. Okay, let's see what that looks like, out of curiosity. Uh, okay, very uh, 90s looking, but hey, whatever gets the Rustations going. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rust is most frequently used for applications where speed, performance, and stability are essential. The awesome Rust list collects examples of Rust projects, which include CLI tools, ORMs, operating systems, and games. Regardless of what you build in Rust, it will be fast and memory safe. Good. Then we have a link to the homepage and some other interesting uh, documentation links, which are gonna stumble upon today, I think. Uh, Hello world looks clear enough, so let's join the Rust track and start with the first exercise. As you're used to, on Exorcism, we are dealing with the usual hello world. I can see there's a uh, pub identifier that says that this function is public, function opened, the function opens with fn keyword and then there's the name of the function any parameter of the function in parentheses an arrow probably telling us what the function returns and then this ampersand tick static string is the return type for sure and then the body of the function is wrapped in uh, curly braces That sounds all right. And we have some help here at the top. It says ampersand static is a lifetime specifier, something you will learn about uh, more about later. Okay, so we'll just we're just going to leave it there for now and ignore it and assume that's something we just do and change the hello world to what we know is right. Pass the test and move on to something more interesting. Submitting, and, uh, yeah, we can we can actually share this. That's okay. And here we go with uh, concepts. So Rust on Exorcism is one of the uh, most well-defined combination of exercises and and concepts, as far as I can see, just from from counting them. Uh, we'll start with functions, uh, which sounds exciting. Sometimes a certain piece of code needs to be used more than once. Yep, we're familiar with the idea. If that's the case, it might be convenient to put the code into a function. A function generally only performs one specific action, which hopefully by now we know. In Rust, the fn keyword is used to define functions. We had inferred this. The code belonging to the function is always between braces. 
and the function name main is a special one because it is the entry point for the programs. From that function you can call other functions. Okay, nothing new here. Uh, you can also see some uh, type de declaration on, on the arguments of a function which we haven't seen before. Uh, they can also take parameters like name, ampersand string, and so on. Okay, so we're probably gonna try this out while making a lasagna. So let's get going with this. If you follow the other two um, videos I've posted, you know everything about lasagnas, but if not, just go back to one of the videos. You'll find them in the description of this one. Um, and this might also be an opportunity to define function, uh, sorry, to define constants uh, or whatever gets the closest to that uh, in Rust. And it seems like we are uh, on the right track. Uh, it says that we can assign a value to a name referred to as binding and bindings rather than variables. Bindings are immutable unless declared with the MUT mute uh, keyword. As Rust is statically typed, each binding has a type known at compile time. Okay, so if we intend on changing the value of a binding, then we want to mark that as mute. Otherwise, we mark it as with a let uh, keyword. Um, the type of a binding, we don't have to specify, uh, but that's optional. And the type inference of the language will just figure it out on its own if we're lucky. Okay especially if we're using literals, um, that sounds good. I'm also noticing semicolons, surprised. I am a bit surprised, okay. Uh, functions are items where bindings typically refer to a particular value. Items refer to a unit of code organization, typically a function or a module, which is available throughout the lifetime of the program, okay. So we should think of bindings as referring to a particular value, okay, and items as units of code organization, either functions or modules, fine. Uh, a function automatically returns the result of its last expression, so we don't have to be explicit about return statements, which is great. A function may have zero or more parameters, which are bindings with a lifetime of the function call. We'll have to We'll have to come back to this, but this, this idea that uh, these bindings, uh, and again, think variables for the time being, uh, only exist throughout the lifetime of the function call. I'm thinking this sounds a lot like scope, uh, and it's a way of talking about scope, but I guess in the context of Rust memory management, it's important that we think about lifetime rather than scope. Okay. Type inference is theoretically possible for functions but it's disabled as an intentional language design choice. So we want to be explicit about types when we declare functions. Okay, sounds good. Um, invoking a function is done by specifying its name followed by parentheses. Yep, that's okay. And um, if a bindings type cannot be inferred, the compiler will complain. Fine. Um, items in Rust can be used before or after they are defined. Uh, because they have a static lifetime. Okay, back to that concept of lifetime and the idea that modules or, or functions we don't need to define before we use. On the other hand, bindings, they can only be used after they have been defined. If we try and use them before we define them, then we get a compile error. Okay. Okay. Scope in Rust is defined by braces, okay. A binding defined within a scope can't escape from it. Uh, this will, will come in handy uh, later as well. Okay, so I guess the fact that items such as functions start with curly braces is not by accident. We are within the scope of the function uh, as we get into the block. Okay. Um. And then how are items organized in Rust? They're organized in modules. It starts with mod and then the familiar curly braces. Okay.
each uh, is implicitly a mo each crate is implicitly a module, but it can define inner submodules of arbitrary depth. Um, okay, that's okay. I think things will get a bit clearer as we go through the exercises. We have two types of comments: single line or multi-line. Nothing new. Um, doc comments show up in generated documentation. This is good to know, but again, a bit too much for this uh, introduction. So let's let's move on into the exercise. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we want to define some sort of constant. And again, from what we understand, we should be able to just say let and then say um, open time and I don't know what the convention is so yeah underscore yeah state case open time is 14 and we need the semicolon and then we should be able to reuse that binding inside the function unless the scope is somehow not able to look out, but I think maybe we can try this out and see how it goes. Oh, actually, there's something different going on here, which is that open time is defined as a function rather than as a constant. Okay, let's try that out. What if I return 40 here? And do I have to use the semicolon? Let's see. Okay. Tail. Okay, remove this semicolon to return this value. Okay, if I want to return, then I remove the semicolon. Okay, let's see. Hmm. <laughs> we'll get we'll have to get used to this, but okay, fine. An expected mean in oven is what we're using as a as a constant. Same same as a constant basically. Remaining minutes in oven We'll do, we'll do expected minutes in oven minus the actual minutes and return the value without the semicolon. Looking good. And then for elapsed time in minutes for multiple layers, I don't know if you remember, but we want to define, we know that each layer takes a couple of minutes to prepare. And so the preparation time in minutes provided the number of layers is given by two times the number of layers. And I wonder, I mean, we can, we can try this out. I wonder if we can, what happens if we define a variable? So in, in other languages, this wouldn't work, right? Because if it's just a variable, if we define a variable outside the function scope, we won't be able to access that variable from within the scope of the function unless that's a constant. Um, but here, I don't know, uh, layer time. If I say layer time equals two, am I allowed to use this inside a function? And probably I want semicolon here. Mm, consider using const. So const does exist, okay. Uh, it says, For glo global variables, want const. Okay. And we need to provide the type. So do we do colon i32? Brilliant. I think we're, yeah, we made it. I don't know if there's a convention for Rust constant convention on naming, all character in constant names are usually uppercase. Okay, so that would look like um, layer time, something like this. And then we can use that here. And we can also move on to the next task, which is about implementing, calculating the elapsed time in minutes. So how much time we spent 
cooking the lasagna and we can reuse the functions we've just defined and just return x remaining minutes in sorry preparation time in minutes on the number of layers multi and then just add the actual minutes in oven that's it we can run the tests go green submit and move on okay this was interesting let's see if there's any recommendation no exorcism doesn't have any recommendation for us on making this any better so let's move on and look at more concepts um, I'd say let's go for enums uh, it might be one of the things Rust does very well, so let's let's check this out. Enums, short for enumerations, are a type that limits all possible values of some data. The possible values of an enum are called variants. They work well with match and other control flow operators to help help you express intent in your Rust program. Sounds great. Um, many languages fail to define enums in a satisfactory way and the community usually iterates over and over until they find a way of uh, doing it in a way that pleases everyone it it might be that rust got it right straight away so semi-structured logs is an exercise i've had the pleasure to look into for another language as well so this should be fun let's see um, we'll be generating semi-structured log messages at three different levels info warning and error mm, this annotation looks amazing i wonder what this is about and it seems like it might be defining methods or functionality on top of the enum just by adding the annotation uh, so that's very nice what we want to do is we want to emit a log message in a certain format including level and message and um, and also define uh, specific um, special functions for each one of the levels just shorthand uh, function for each one of them and then if we want we can do a bit more but I don't think we can access um, that advanced extra bit of functionality through the web UI so that's gonna have to do so first step emit semi-structured messages oh sorry uh, you'll start with some stub functions here we are so we have info warn error error and log we'll probably want to reuse log in each one of these or the other way around let's see what comes easier And this is the format we're looking for okay so let's let's give it a go all right we haven't read much about string interpolation but maybe we can try with something si very very simple and then take it from there like i wonder if we can just say uh, just do this and then plus the message and put the level in here so what would that be would be something like plus info and info we can probably get from the enum so we can do log level and uh, how do we actually access values so maybe we need to go into rust enums and look at how not only they are defined but actually used okay double double column for for scope okay scope access so that would look like this and i don't know if there's an implicit conversion to string or if we have to call anything but let's just try it out and see what we get um cannot add log level to string good to know so types are not compatible ecopore there is also the to do macro that is basically the same as unimplemented but it's shorter to type ah here you mean right so could i go like to do and with the exclamation mark or without 
Oh yeah, with. Okay, I'll try it out because um, methods came with unimplemented, but to do sounds great. Uh, and here, can we convert to string? I guess we can. Just looking at some docs. Same way we go from string to enum. I'm expecting to be able to do the opposite. String. Is there a to string? Do you know about a to string conversion? Maybe two, the same way. No. Okay, let's look it up again. First image to string. I'm not the only one looking for this. To string method. Okay, let's try this. And see if this. Uh, yeah, and I forgot the parenthesis, so I think I need to actually go. Open those parentheses. Log level cannot be formatted with the default formatter. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if we, so if these are traits, I don't know if they are, but if they are, I wonder if we can add one uh, to just say, look, I just want to be able to format them in a, in a trivial way and I don't want to have to define this all of this wow that would be too much I don't know how you feel about this so this is actually a very interesting feature of the language where we can look at the enum here and we can define apparently what is called a trait for log levels and what this means is if, as long as we define a format function or whatever is expected by the specific trait and then tiny bit of copy pasting here but provide a conver conversion to string or a formatting to string then we can use the to string method is nice let's see if it works because if it does i'm just it's a great thing to learn i think um use of undeclared crate or module fmt i think i need to maybe import the module Uh, how do you do that in Rust? Import MT. Use, okay. Let's see. Maybe we're straying away from the intended, intended exercise, but. Use undeclared type level. Yeah, this is log level rather than level. Maybe that was the problem. Cannot be used to concatenate. Okay, plus cannot be used to concatenate a string with a string. Uh, create an owned string on the left and add a borrow on the right. Okay, we're getting a bit too deep into this. I just want to format the string. Um, can I just do Rust string interpolation? Hmm format okay maybe we'll can we try and format let's see uh, so we're getting close but let's see if there would, would be something like format exclamation mark and from chat ecopore do you know what the exclamation mark at the end of the method name is about it would be interesting to know so we'll have something like level or actually just this then pass this and then the message let's see oh things 
ending with exclamation mark are macros. Good to know. Thank you. That makes sense. It's a good practice. Uh, and let's see how far we are from the, from the desired outcome. If I go for info, for example, and it's info, log in, it's info, panicked and at not implemented return message. So it's probably using this one. All right, so capitalization. Okay, nothing, nothing big. So we implemented this right. It's just that it wants a capital level here. So we'll just look at how we capitalize. Last capitalize like upcase string. There's probably some. Oh yeah, to uppercase looks good enough. Let's see. Then we can maybe. Well, because, uh, as usual, I forget parentheses because um, Ruby and Crystal don't need parentheses when there's no argument and that tricks me. Okay, so we have made some progress. Let's try and revisit what we've done so far. And I think there are different approaches to this, right? One could match maybe on the type of, uh, and maybe that's the desired uh, behavior here, but one could match on the log level and then based on the log level type log different things but I think it's still quite handy to define the, the format display trait implementation um, this is also interesting okay let's see if we can uh, how, how do we go about uh, wrapping this up right um, Uh, Ecobor, you say, as far as I know, there are basically two types of macros, the ones that look like functions but end with a, an exclamation mark and the, uh, and the other that are used through, oh, through the annotations, okay, hash, derive macro here and so on, right, so same as uh, we have here, hash, derive, and then the rest, cool, cool. Okay, I think we can do. I think we can do something similar to what we did here. Let's see. So when logging at a certain level, do we do something like this, where we do match level, and then based on what we see, we call the right function, like um, info doesn't seem looks a bit wasteful but maybe we can iterate from this I don't even know if this will um, compile to be honest error uh, there's a couple of commas here which we don't want Warn, it's warn, not warning. So, compiler has been very helpful with us uh, so far. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, so we're passing some tests now. Uh, this seems to do the trick. Uh, we just need to apply the same approach to other ones. But then, I, I guess at this point, one could just say, look, just do this. Can you just format and then do level to string? Forget about the match thing altogether. Let's see. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think this, this will get us there. Unless we, uh, okay, yeah, this works a bit better. 
and then Ecopor, uh, with, sorry, I've got a bit of delay on the on the chat. You mentioned yes, the derived clone is expanding to a derived clone for the annotated type and so on. Sorry, in, implement implement clone, yeah, and clone is a trait that makes sense. Okay, yeah. There's something similar in Crystal where you can add um, the implementation of a bunch of methods onto a, an object just by uh, bringing in um, some uh, some macros. I'm thinking about well, usually you would just in Crystal you would just call the macro within the body of the module or the class, and that would for example, implement the clone methods or the equality as it normally is intended, uh, structural equality or comparison, if you will. Okay, I think we are getting there. And I think the next step would be to just say, look, now we've gone through the trouble of defining log in a very clever way. We might as well just do log, uh, log level info and then the message. And do the same for the other two functions and then and then we're good so this is going to be log level warn is it yeah warning and this is going to be log level uh, error okay i think we'll we're going to be green now um I guess the, the question is whether we were supposed to actually go the format display way, but I think this was super instructive. So very grateful that we got to try that out. No recommendation as far as I can see. And we can share this with the word. Thank you, Ecopore, for um, the support in, in figuring this out. Very, very good to know a bit more about concepts uh, like, like macros in, in uh, Rust, although we don't need to know how to write them, it's good to know when, when you're, you know, stumbling into one. Uh, let's move into floating point. That's going to be interesting to compare Rust with other language we are more familiar with. Um, floating point numbers are numbers with zero or more digits behind the decimal separator. Okay, and nothing new here. And then we have some examples. Uh, cool. We are in the assembly line. Uh, we'll be writing code to analyze the production of an assembly line in a car factory. The assembly line speed can range from 0 to 10. At its lowest speed, 221 cars are produced each hour. The production increases linearly with the speed. So with the speed set to 4, which go 4 times 2021, sorry, 221 um, cars per hour. However, higher speeds uh, increase the likelihood that faulty cars are produced which is something we've seen in similar exercises for other languages. Okay, so the success rate drops from 100% to 77%. Uh, as the speed goes up, we should calculate the production rate per hour and then the number of working items produced per minute. Okay, we've, uh, let's see where we get. Um, production rate per hour, we have some instructions here and I think we can maybe define a set of constant uh, to make it a bit easier for us to um, go through this. For example, well, let's see. Because um, the production rate per hour based on the speed is going to take into account the success rate. Yeah. And so, so 222 is definitely a constant. So constant, uh, let's say speed equals two to one, or if you want, what is, what is this? Uh, is speed is 221. We might have to tell the compiler what this is. So I'll say it's an int 32. And then, what else? We have a set of success rates. We can um, extract them in a moment, but here we're saying if the speed, and I don't know if we're supposed to go if already, but 
if speed is uh, less than four, less or equal, oh, let's say less than five, then we do something. Do we have a ternary operator in Rust? That might make our life a bit easier. Um, no, but we have a short syntax for if else. So let's try this out. So if we do if, so what was it? No parentheses, just curly braces in the body of the if. So if speed is less than five, then we do. So we always do, we always do speed times base speed. And we call it uh, without fault. Or without or before fault units before fault and we say this is a let just a binding and we say it's speed times base speed and then if it is less than five okay we can do this we can return units before fault times whatever comes out of it of this thing which is if speed is less than five, then it's gonna be a 100% rate. So we just return one. Else, do we have else if? No, do we? Okay, fine, let's, let's try with just else. And say, if speed is less than, what was it? Nine. then the rate is 90% 0 0.9 else it's 77% 0 0.77 and I'm gonna read the suggestion yep regular if else there is no shorter version okay happy enough uh, base speed okay I'll try else if uh, in a moment then uh, what does the compiler want? Uh, expect U8 found I32. Hmm, interesting. Let's speed. Okay, we can make this an unsigned integer. Can we? 221. What does it go for U8? To, to the power of 8 should be okay. Yeah, we can make this a U8. An unsigned integer with 8 bit. Right, I should probably just make this a 1.0, let the compiler infer the type this way. And then hmm, I can't, can't multiply a U8. Oh, I see. So I think we have this situation where we have an unsigned integer, 8 bit integer, and we want to which is speed, and we want to multiply it for a float, but we can't do that. Um, so what did I miss here? Uh, converting between numbers. Rust doesn't do any implicit type conver conversion. This means that if you need to turn one numeric type into another, you have to do so explicitly. Okay, when converting from a larger type to a smaller type, you could lose data. Yes, good to know. Converting from a floating point to an integer will lose everything behind the decimal point. But we're not told how to do the conversion. So I am assuming I can do something like, um, what was the complaint here? Float, can I? And just say uh, float. conversion in, in parentheses, does that even work? And then speed is not in scope. <laughs> okay, cannot find function float, okay, in this scope, okay. Mm, so how do we go about converting uh, last 
float conversion int float conversion f64 okay f64 is what we're after makes sense because it um, seems like we have to let the compiler know how many bits we want to allocate that number and now we have found built-in type f64 yes uh, how do I go about doing that Ooh, as okay fine so conversion to an f64 would be something like as f64 wow this looks a bit dangerous I don't know if I'm doing this right and yeah it seems I am and then production rate per hour at speed 4 we're failing at tensor multiply with overflow okay so we have an unsigned integer so when when uh, when the production hour so we we this works fine for speed one and speed zero. As soon as we go to speed four, we are attempting to multiply with overflow, which is a great um, on line eight, uh, which means that, oh, I see, I see. Because I was just thinking it's going to be okay to have a U8 for 221, but then actually we multiply and we get out of the eight bit. Because we have, so to the power of eight, so how many integers can we represent here? So with um, one, so with, with one bit, we represent two integers. With two bit, we represent four. So with two to the power of eight, we represent the one, to the power of five, 32, 64, 128, 250, um, yeah 200, 256 and then we go up right so i think what we should do is we should keep this as an inter as an i32 just to not have to worry about it and then convert the speed to an i32 so that we can go about doing our multiplication with no problem and no overflow risk and then we convert the units before fault to f64 we might even just go straight into F64, but okay, let's see. A bit better, okay? So we passed all the tests for the production rate. Um, and again, since speed was an unsigned integer, sorry, an unsigned int with eight bit, um, it's, and we have to multiply that by 221, and we have at most 256 integer represented that way with an unsigned integer of 8 bit we have to actually convert to another uh, representation to be able to multiply 221 for uh, a number larger than 1 and so the decision here was to just go and say look let's stick to integer 32 might be a bit wasteful might want to go down a bit but you know whatever allows us to represent 221 times 9 uh, or times 10 actually because that 10 is also a, a, a speed that is um, possible to achieve uh, so whatever allows us to represent 2,210 2, integer we can go with that representation if we care about uh, memory and then from that we make sure that we are multiplying compatible values in terms of types we do the same thing when we want to go to floating 64 and then depending on the speed we multiply with for by by the success rate which is 100% 90% and then 77% depending on how quickly we are producing cars um, and if we want to co compute the number of working items per minute this is going to depend on the speed and we are going to use the production rate per hour and speed this is going to return an f64 and if we divide this by 60 minutes we're gonna get a floating point number representing the number of cars we produce with success per minute but here we want an integer uh, an unsigned 30 integer of 32 bits 
and we just want to know how the spec wants us to approximate to that uh, how many working cars are produced per minute um, and we probably want to go down so round and maybe maybe we can just convert and say this number which is an, an f64 as a u32 and we're going to lose the information on the decimal points and that's going to be okay there you go okay lots of learnings it feels like um, every exercise so far has been a bit of a brain melting exercise but one where we learned a lot so happy with this so far um, i suggest we take a short break and then we come back what have we done so far we looked into functions integers constant definition we implemented the trait which i don't know if it was the intention of the uh, a log formatting exercise but that was great we looked at enums that was also really interesting uh, and so what's next we have structs methods external crates and vec the vec macro i think we can start with struct and see how far we go um, it says it is often useful to group a collection of items together and handle those groups as a unit as units in rust we call such a group a struct and each item uh, and each item one of the struts field well, I don't understand this sentence a struct defines the general set of fields available but a particular example of a struct is called an instance not dissimilar to other um, languages so let's see if we can do health statistics this is the first we're working on implementing a health monitoring system as part of that you need to keep track of users health statistics you'll start with some stub functions in an imp block as well as the following struct definition okay a user is defined as a group of three bits of information name age and weight your goal is to implement the stub out methods on the user struct defined in the imp block okay for example, the new method should return an, an instance of the user struct with the specified name, age, weight, and weight values. Sort of like a struct constructor, let's say. So it sounds good. The weight method should return the weight of the user, and so on and so forth. And I can imagine if one is actually working with Rust in and day out, they have plenty of macros to actually do all of that for them, because they don't see people having to redefine this sort of constructor and uh, get their methods. Uh, for, for structs but I guess it's quite instructive to actually do it on our own uh, before we move to using macros wow the introduction is quite dense let's let's go through it mm. structs can have methods defined on them much like uh, objects um, and the struct is referred, referred to internally as a, as a self the same as in, uh, I guess, Ruby, maybe Crystal, Scala probably. When a method uses ampersand self, the fields can be changed or mutated. When a method uses, uses ampersand self, the fields cannot be changed. They are immutable. Okay. Control immutability helps the borrow checker ensure that entire classes of concurrency bugs um, just don't happen in Rust. Okay, we're gonna be careful with that. Yeah, and on the topic of macros, Ecobor, you mentioned Ecobor. Why do I keep on doing that? Ecobor, I'm sorry, Ecobor. Uh, uh, you mentioned that there is a drive default which implements a default trait uh, that has a single default method that returns the default value, which makes sense. Uh, and I can expect there's, there's even richer uh, stuff than that, right? Um, in this exercise, so thinking about this borrowing, uh, sorry, these mutable, not mutable references to self, I guess when we are defining getters, we want to make sure we're using ampersand self, and we are when we are setting fields, then we want to use ampersand moot self. Um, in this exercise, you'll be implementing two kinds of methods on a struct. The first are generally known as getters. We are familiar with this, and then in Rust, these methods idiomatically share the name of the field they expose 
Okay, that's quite common. Um, if we have a getter method that fetches a struct field called name, then the method name is going to be name. Okay, we'll also be implementing methods of another type, generally known, uh, known as setters. Okay, these change the value of the field. Setters aren't very common in Rust. If a field can be freely modified, it is more common to just make it public. Okay, so it's a language where the convention is to just operate on the field rather than going through a setter method. Okay, but they're useful if updating the field should have side effects or for access control. Okay, a setter marked as pub create allows other modules within the same crate to update a private field which can't be affected by the outside world. Okay, maybe this is a bit too much for where we are right now. Uh, structs come in uh, three flavors. Structs with name fields, tuple structs, and unit structs. For this concept exercise, we'll be exploring the first variant, structs with name fields. Structs are defined using the struct keyword followed by the capitalized name of the type the struct is describing. And additional types are then brought into the struct body as fields of the struct, each with their own type. Makes perfect sense. Uh, finally, methods can be defined on structs inside an impl uh, block. This is the first time I see this today, if I'm not mistaken. With that brief introduction, let's go. What are we supposed to do? Oh, we have a bit of everything. Okay, let's see if we can just figure it out from what we have so far, right? So I'm thinking about uh, the constructor thing and how do we go about um, setting the values of a, of a struct? Because that's not something we've seen so far, have we? Oh, is it just... Yeah. How do we go about defining uh, a struct? Do we assign values to a new thing? Hmm. I think I'll ask Google how to do that. So Rust struct definition new define instantiation. That's what what I actually want. Oh, just like that. Okay, easy enough. But yeah, something we really need to get a bit of support on, right? We can't just figure this out on our own, I think. So, so we just say user and then open the curly braces and give it the field names and close the braces. Okay, so we're gonna have name, we're gonna have age and weight. And then weight is gonna be just weight. String. Interesting that, uh, yeah, I'm not really familiar with why we're going through the trouble of going string from. I wonder, but for the time being, we're just going to do assign each field to the argument being passed in and returning. So, no semicolon. Let's see. I think this is okay. It's just there's no test for the constructor. So this was uh, deemed to be too trivial. It took us a bit of time. And then extracting, how do we go about extracting fields? Um, can we just access the, the value? So just self we just say self dot name consider bor consider borrowing here ampersand self name okay let me try that and then we can reflect on why this works or not okay 
What if I don't do this? Right, because we're returning, I guess we're returning a reference to a string rather than a new string. Or rather than the string itself. So it makes sense from the method signature that we are going for ampersand here. But again, yeah, I'm not too sold on this. I would have to play with this a bit more. But I guess we're going to do this and that. And we're going to be done with the getters, I think. And in this case, okay, I guess this is all based on the way integers and strings are allocated, but uh, I guess strings are allocated dynamically and we're passing a reference to them. And for integers, we're just passing the instances, but I would, I would have to check what I'm saying is actually accurate. Uh, okay. And then let's define the setters. You can see that the reference to self is now self is now mutable and can we just say self dot set, set dot age equals new age and also I wonder what we want to return here it, it seems like we're not returning anything so I'm just gonna put a semicolon at the end and let's do the same for weight There we go. Okay. I also wonder what the habit, like what, what the convention here is with um, uh, setters. It seems like setters are not returning anything. So you just have this side effect and then you want to, you have to go back to the object reference to do uh, others, to perform other side effects. But again, interesting to hear that one would access the field directly in other languages. I guess coming from Scala, and then that's something I tend to do on, on crystal uh, objects as well. The idea is that when you define setters, you're actually creating copies of the original objects. And something nice about that is that every setter call will return the new object. And that also means that you can concatenate calls to setters in a way where we do start from a user object, and then you set age, set name, set weight, and that generates a number of different objects and it might feel a bit wasteful because you're going through the you're allocating memory for each one of these objects but at the end of the day um, you know depending on the context the value might be higher than the actual uh, wasted memory allocation um, especially if you're working on uh, objects we whose field reference um, uh, dynamically allocated um, stuff uh, and so you're you're never you're not allocating more memory you're just defining new pointers to areas of memory that might be um, important so yeah interesting interesting approach so so far we've gone through quite a few concepts we've uh, ikobor you, you mentioned oh you could return Ampersand mute self. Yeah, yeah, I guess you could, right? I guess you could. Um, but it's interesting to see what the conventions around setters actually are. Because uh, at the end of the day, what matters even more in, the, in, a, in a work context is whatever consistent or conventional mean is what one should adopt, adopt at the end of the day. So rather than try and be fancy and, and go like, oh yeah, I've seen this concept in another language, I want to bring it in. And that maybe breaks with some of the habits and, uh, and conventions of the team, I guess you would just accept that. Um, yeah, uh, that this is the way the language is intended uh, to be used. Um, and yes, yeah, setters are not really used on the core lib libs, as far as you know, Ecopore, that, that makes sense. Nice. Okay, we have one more exercise to go to get to the five uh, exercise beyond um, the hello world. What do we go for? We went through structs. Uh, we 
now understand methods a bit more uh, I'd say let's go for destructuring it seems nice and then we can wrap up hopefully this is not a super long exercise it says um, we're working on a game targeting a low power embedded system and need to write several convenience functions which will be used by other parts of the game okay quotient is the output of a division yes mm. choose even positioned items from an iterator this will be helpful to enable screen buffers buffer optimization your boss promises um, iterators are items which expose the methods defined by iterate the iterator trait the documentation is fairly extensive because they offer many methods here are some the, the most relevant properties that we have an iterator in is an arbitrary length stream of items okay they have an enumerate method which returns a tuple with the index and the value they have a filter method which uses a closure to determine whether to to yield an element of the iterator yes this is similar to select in uh, ruby they have a map method which uses a closure to modify elements of the iterator again this uh, sounds very very similar to map in other languages because your function can run on any kind of iterator it uses impl to signify that this is a trait instance instead of a simple item okay likewise uh, the item equal t syntax just means that it doesn't matter what kind of item the, the iterator produces your function can produce the even elements of any iterator okay this goes back to some sort of generics uh, implementation or generics uh, and that's a, that's really it okay let's see if we can uh, get somewhere with this finally calculating the Manhattan, Manhattan distance of a position from the origin which is just the sum of x and y uh, distance uh, from a given point mm. so in this case uh, x equals 3 y equals 4 distance from the origin is 3 plus 4 7 okay let's see tuples are a lightweight way to group a fixed set of arbitrary types of data together okay it's just like a struct just not ex quite ex a struct right a tuple doesn't have any particular name so uh, it's at some sort of uh, an anon anonymous struct um, naming a data structure turns it into a struct a tuples field don't have names they are accessed by means of destructuring or by position so rather than having a struct with fields having a name we just can access fields by position or destructuring uh, creating them okay so they're defined in in, uh, in parentheses that's easy we put comma if we want a single element after the first element okay and then destructuring the should be trivial because we just go let and then extract stuff Meanwhile, yeah, thank you, Ecopor. Yeah, you mentioned the type vec represent a vector and has one setter method that returns nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, oh, we're here to learn. Uh, so taking everything, I think it's, it's good to actually try and speculate and talk about what the expectations are around the way something works. And then maybe we are wrong. We just fix our view of the world. But, but I think it's good to make ourselves an idea of how things might work and then uh, you know uh, fix that as we go redefine expectations thank you for, for uh, making this, this conversation interesting um, okay so the structuring looks easy access by position easy not very common we, we might be used to accessing things with the square brackets but actually we go for dot and then tuple structs you will also be asked to work with tuple structs like normal structs there are these are name types unlike normal structs they have anonymous fields okay their syntax is very similar to a normal tu tuple 
syntax, it is legal to use both destructuring and positional access. Okay. Not a big difference between tuple structs and the tuples, except the fact that except for the fact that we are naming the second one or the first one, tuple structs. Uh, in terms of field visibility, all fields of anonymous tuples are always public. However, fields of tuple structs have individual visibility. Okay. Um, which defaults to private, just like fields of standard structs. Okay, you can make the fields public with the pub modifier. Sounds good. Destructible structs, okay. Fine. Fields are public. Okay, so if we add the pub modi modifier to the field definition, then the field is going to be public. Instruction, let's go. You're working on a game targeting a low power embedded system, as we know, and, and need to write several convenience functions which will be used by other parts of the game. Task one, calculate the quotient and remainder of a division. The quotient is the output of a division. Yes, thank you. Um, so given the dividend and the divisor, this is where tuple actually come in handy. We can return rather than having to call two different functions, we can return a tuple. The first value is going to be the quotient and the second part is going to be the remainder, the second element. Uh, and we don't need to define anything because these, these are all um, anonymous. We are working on i16, so integer 16. I wonder if we can just do dividend divided by divisor and then dividend percent, which is usually the operator for the remainder. Uh, let's see how we and how we fail here. Nice. Okay, we're off to a good start. So we define an anonymous tuple. And this is very handy again in the context where you you want to return more than a value out of a out of a function and you want don't want to name that that object being returned. So that, that's handy. I wouldn't recommend stretching this, but definitely good for something like divmod. Uh, what about the second part of the exercise? Choose even positioned items from an iterator. Okay. Uh, so we're, we probably want to filter. Yeah. An example, an example of that would be to go a.iter, then filter, and then this is how we define a predicate. It looks similar enough to what we might be familiar with from other languages, let's see. So can we just do in, sorry, iter dot filter, because this is already an iterator, and then we filter x, so something like is even, I don't know if this even <laughs> exists, let's see and we probably want to remove the semicolon is even doesn't exist but we can probably say well, we can reuse the operator we just defined just for the sake of reusing stuff and say give me the div mod of x and 2 and take the second element which is dot 1 and I want this to be equal to 0 because that's what even numbers have in common the remainder from the division by two is um, zero. And then on expectations on types, so X is of type T, ooh, okay, X is of type T, so we can't do this. That's a shame. We don't really want to assume that T is an I16. But then it's a bit of a shame that we define the function without them being able to use this. So, so can we just say this? <laughs> okay, so we're a bit early. So X is a ref, so you defer using star. Okay, but what would the... Oh, and if I defer, then can I cast? 
Okay, so if I was, what if I was to just say so x? So if I do x percent two equals zero, is it gonna complain that we don't know if we have the remainder operator available? Is that even legal? Oh, is rem a uh, keyword, a special keyword? Oh, not, not 36 here, 16 is what I meant. So this is what was suggested by the compiler. You can try and remove the ampersand. That doesn't seem to help. Core ops, <laughs> rem, oh my. Is this something I need to do? Okay, okay. Let's let's take a step back. Maybe we are overcomplicating this. Uh, let's see. Starting from the beginning, starting from the top, because this is something that we're so yeah, this is very likely what we're supposed to do. Okay, I think this is where we give up. defeated by Rust generics nonsense, or maybe the nonsense of this specific exercise, or my in ignorance, that's also a pretty plausible op option. Okay, so let's just try and, and recap how far we got so far. We've done four exercises plus the yellow word, which were good. We got stuck onto generics with this low power embedded game. But we'll come back stronger than ever, maybe tomorrow, maybe who knows, just need to go back, reassess our lives under the Rust microscope and understand what we want to do with generics. Um, thank you very much for watching this uh, uh, and thanks for supporting, special thanks to Ecopore for being so um, um, present in, in providing suggestions to get us unblocked. Uh, and hopefully we'll do more of this. So, and also I will accept suggestions on the next language we should look into, uh, past Rust, if we ever make it past Rust. But yeah, thanks again for watching and see you very, very, very soon. Bye.